In this episode of Real Chemistry, we're going to talk about a new type of chemical formula. It's called the empirical formula. What you're normally used to hearing is called a molecular formula, and that just tells you the exact number of atoms that are in a molecule. So for example, if your molecular formula is C8H18, that's just telling you you have eight carbons in that molecule and 18 hydrogens. On the other hand, your empirical formula is the simplest ratio of elements in your compound. In other words, if you think about C8H18, that tells me about the ratio between carbon and hydrogen, and I can actually reduce C8H18 to C4H9. So the empirical formula, which would correspond to that molecular formula, is C4H9. And the reason is, is all I did was divide H8 by 2 and 18 by 2 to get out C4H9. Now that's the simplest ratio of carbon to hydrogen. Why is this useful? Why is this a thing? Good question. Well, it turns out when we go into the lab, lots of times we don't measure exactly how many of each atom type are in a molecule. Instead, what we get out is just the ratio. So when you go into the lab and say you have a bunch of C8H18 in a beaker and you do some measurements on it, your measurements might spit out, yeah, there's four carbons for every nine hydrogens, but it won't tell you that your exact molecule is C8H18. And that's why it's called empirical. The word empirical is just implying that there's something related to measurement. So empirical is what we can measure or experiment on. And so the empirical formula is what's easily determined from experiment. Let's talk a little bit more about empirical formulas so you can get this idea down. Now, if you haven't watched Molecules and Percent Mass, I recommend you do that first. It'll help you understand this video. So the key thing to understand here is that if I give you an empirical formula, I'm really just telling you the ratio of the elements in that compound. But I'm not telling you exactly how many are out there. So, for example, if I have the empirical formula SO2, what that's telling me is that I have a compound. For every one sulfur, there's two oxygens. But there's a huge range of molecular formulas that could correspond to. So a bunch of possible molecular formulas. So the possible molecular formulas all must have the same ratio of sulfur to oxygen. So for example, I could have two sulfurs and then I would have to have four oxygens. Notice that's the same ratio as one sulfur to two oxygen. Or, for example, I could have S3O6. Again, twice as many oxygens as sulfur. Or you could even get more ridiculous. You could have S10O20. So the empirical formula corresponds to a ton of different molecular formulas. So it's not a specific molecule. Instead, it's just telling you that you have a sample and in it, you know the ratio of your elements. In this case, you know that there's one sulfur for every two oxygen. So let's talk about what sort of problems you typically do with empirical formulas. Since empirical formulas are basically those formulas which we can measure more easily from experiment, the typical problem you'll be given will just tell you the percent by mass of a compound. So for example, you might be given the problem that a compound is found to be 19.7% by mass nitrogen and 80.3% by mass fluorine. And the question is determine the empirical formula. Now you can't determine the molecular formula. You cannot use that information to figure out exactly how many nitrogens and fluorines are in the compound that we're taking a look at. All you can do is determine the ratio of those elements in that compound. So I'm going to do two examples in this video to give you an idea of how to do these calculations. And I've broken it down into a few steps here. First thing you want to do is just want to assume that your sample size is 100 grams. Why do you do that? Well, that just makes your numbers easy to work with. So it doesn't matter what your sample size was. You would get out the same empirical formula if you started with a kilogram or a billion grams or 100 grams. But 100 grams is just a simple number to assume. So we're going to assume that we had a 100 gram sample. And that means that if 19.7% of that was nitrogen, since I assumed 100 grams for my total sample, I just have 19.7 <laughs> grams of nitrogen. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to write down for nitrogen that I have 19.7 grams. And I'm going to write down that for fluorine, I have 80.3 grams. So all I'm doing there is I'm saying, let's pretend the total mass of my sample is 100 grams 
And then if that's the case, 19.7 grams would be nitrogen and 80.3 grams would be, in fact, fluorine. And the whole goal here is to figure out how many atoms of each type there are. And as we know, uh, if you've watched the percent mass video, mass by itself doesn't tell us whether there's more nitrogen and fluorine. The only thing that tells us whether there's more nitrogen or fluorine is the number of moles we have of each. And that's why the second step is calculating the moles of each element. That's going to allow us to actually compare how many nitrogens we have, how many nitrogen atoms we have, to how many fluorine atoms we have. So when we calculate moles, remember all we're going to be doing is using the molar mass of nitrogen and fluorine. So this calculation will basically take our 19.7 grams of nitrogen and we're going to take the conversion factor one mole and we're going to divide that by our molar mass of nitrogen, which turns out to be 14 grams. And when we do that, that's going to spit out our moles of nitrogen, which turns out to be 1.407. And you don't want to round here. You want to write down the full number or store it in your calculator, and that'll be important in a second. Okay, we're going to do the same thing with fluorine. We're going to convert our fluorine from grams to moles. And what we're going to do there is we're going to just do the same thing. We're going to divide by the molar mass of fluorine. Again, the molar mass can be found on your periodic table, and for fluorine, it's 19 grams. And when we do that division, we're going to get out that there is 4.226 moles of our fluorine. So we've done step one and step two. In step one, we assumed there was 100 grams of our sample so that we could say we have 19.7 grams of nitrogen and 80.3 grams of fluorine. And then we said, well, we can't compare directly our ratios in terms of mass because different elements weigh different amounts. And that's why we converted to moles, so that we could get a comparison of how many actual nitrogen atoms we have to how many actual fluorine atoms we have. Now what we do is we divide all the amounts we just calculated by the smallest number of moles. What do I mean by that? Well, nitrogen, we have 1.407 moles. Fluorine, we have 4.226 moles. So the lower number there is our 1.407. So we're just gonna go ahead and divide that by 1.407, and we're also going to divide our fluorine answer by 1.407. And we're doing that, basically it's like simplifying a fraction. This is just going to give us a simple whole number ratio, hopefully, of nitrogen to fluorine. And notice that we're dividing by moles in both cases, so our moles actually cancel out, and what we're going to be left with is just a unitless number that tells us the ratio of fluorine to nitrogen. So when we do that division for nitrogen, 1.407 divided by 1.407, we just get 1, and that's pretty straightforward. So the number of our nitrogens is probably 1 in our empirical formula. However, when we do it for fluorine, we actually get 3.003. Okay. The last step is we just want to simplify those to whole numbers. And there's two possible things we need to do here. One is if we just have a number that's really close to a whole number, we just round. So notice it says in these steps, if it's very close to a whole number, we just round. On the other hand, if it's far from a whole number, we have to multiply it by some whole number. And I'll show you an example of that in the next uh, slide. But in this case, we're really close to a whole number. 3.003 is really close to a whole number. So then all we're going to do is round. And we're going to round 3.003 to 3. Why do we do that? Well, we know that the, the elements can only combine in whole number ratios. So if we got 3.003, it's probably because we made a little mistake in our experiment and slightly mismeasured the mass of one of those two compounds. So what this just told us is we have one nitrogen for every three fluorines. And that tells us that our empirical formula is N1F3. Of course, we usually don't draw that one. So we have nitrogen trifluoride, NF3. So there's a lot there, but basically what we're doing is we're using the percent mass, and we're going from percent mass to how many moles we would be expected to have of each of those guys so that we can compare the ratio of the number of nitrogen atoms to the number of fluorine atoms. And that gives us a class of compounds. This tells us our empirical formula is NF3. And again, we don't know the molecular formula. We don't know that our compound has exactly one nitrogen and exactly three fluorines. All we know is that the ratio of nitrogen to fluorine is one to three. 
Let's do another example. Okay, so in this problem, we're told that a compound is found to be 18.3% hydrogen by mass and 81.7% carbon by mass. And again, we're just asked to determine the empirical formula. So again, the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to say, let's pretend we have 100 grams. And the reason we do that is so that we can just take our percent, 18.3, to be a mass, 18.3 grams. And the same thing for the carbon, we can just say we have 81.7 grams of carbon. And that always works if you assume your mass is 100 grams. So once again, I'm going to do this, this set of calculations for both hydrogen and carbon. So for hydrogen, we're going to be starting with 18.3 grams. And for carbon, we're going to be starting with 81.7. All right. Now, step two, still calculate the moles of each element. And so the way we do that is dividing each of those by their molar mass, which we can find on the periodic table. So our conversion factor that we get is one mole divided by 1.01 grams. That's the molar mass of hydrogen. And when we do that calculation, we'll get out 18.118 moles. Again, you want to keep these full numbers in your calculators. Now, for 81.7 grams of carbon, we again use the molar mass to convert from grams to moles. The reason we have to convert from grams to moles is because we care about the number of atoms of carbon and hydrogen not the mass of carbon and hydrogen. And so we have one mole of carbon for every 12.01 grams. Again, that's found on the periodic table. And when we do that math, we'll get 4.226 moles. All right, and then our step three says divide all amounts by the smallest number of moles. In this case, the smallest number of moles is carbon. We have 4.226 moles of carbon and 18.118 moles of hydrogen. So I'm going to divide both numbers by 4.226. And when I do that, that's going to start getting me towards the whole number ratio that tells me about how many hydrogens I have for every carbon. So when I do that with carbon, I get out one it's the same number that's always going to be the case for your smallest one and when I do that for hydrogen I get out 2.68 and that's a little bit of a problem because 2.68 is not close to a whole number that's right in the middle of two and three and so when we go to step four and it says simplify that to a whole numbers well this is really far from a whole number or 2.68 is. So that means we're going to have to multiply these things. What do I mean by that? Well, what you want to do is you want to guess numbers to multiply 2.68 by until you happen upon a whole number that gives you a whole number of hydrogen atoms. Let me show you what I mean. So I'm just going to start at 2, and I'm going to work my way up. If I multiply 2.68 by 2, I'm going to get out 5.37. And we can see that's not close to a whole number still. So the correct number to multiply it by must not be 2. So 5.37 is wrong. Let's try 3. 2.68 times 3. When I multiply it by 3, I'm going to get out 8.001. So I get out basically 8. Now that's a whole number. So I know that I've found the right number to multiply it by. Why does any of this make any sense? Well, basically what we're doing is we're just simplifying our, our ratio to whole numbers. We know that we have a ratio of 2.68 hydrogens for every one carbon. That's what our, our math originally spit out. And now, since we can't have half a hydrogen atom, we just have to multiply both of those numbers by something until we get out a whole number. And since I multiplied the number that it spit out for hydrogen by 3, I have to do the same thing with carbon. So I'm going to do 1 times 3, and that's going to give me 3. So what that's telling me is I have 8 hydrogens for every 3 carbons. That basically just found a whole number ratio between my hydrogens and carbons, because I can't have half a hydrogen, and I can't have half a carbon. And so that gives me the molecular formula, or I'm sorry, the empirical formula, 
C3H8. So, three carbons to every eight hydrogens. That turns out to be the same ratio as 2.68 hydrogens to every one carbon, but we needed to find whole numbers, and that's why we did that multiplication step. So that's the empirical formula for something with those percent masses. So again, to review, empirical formula just tells you the ratio of the number of atoms of each type in your compound. And the reason that's useful is lots of experiments you do in the laboratory will only tell you the percent by mass of each type of element. And from that information, we can't get the molecular formula. We can't get the exact number of elements of each type in the molecule. All we can work out is the ratio. And that's why it's called the empirical formula, because the empirical formula is something we can directly measure readily. So that does it for this episode of Real Chemistry. Please ask any questions on this somewhat more complicated lesson below. Please visit my channel to see other chemistry videos or subscribe to receive updates.